Parka. I'm a mister, so there's a misprint in your in your program. I'm not a doctor. I'm a mister. Um, I have a, a bachelor's degree from UCLA in geology and a master's from USC. And I did do uh, work toward a PhD. I did enough coursework, but I had a young family and a job. And, you know, I didn't stop to do a dissertation, so I never did get a PhD. I'm a retired professional geologist. I spent one year in mining exploration in Ethiopia, and that was for looking for potash reserves uh, in the Danakil Depression, which is part of the Great Rift Valley of Eastern Ethiopia, of Eastern East Africa. I was over there for about a year. I spent about 30 years or thereabouts as a petroleum exploration geologist. That was both international and domestic. I spent six years in Canada. I spent three years in Libya before Gaddafi was in power, fortunately. That was then known as the United Kingdom of Libya. And then uh, worked domestically as well and internationally. Did a lot of traveling overseas. Uh, worked as an environmental geologist for about 15 years in uh, Michigan. And since uh, 2005, I've been an adjunct professor of geology here at uh, JCC. I also teach a course in, in physical geography and uh, uh, maybe another one or so along the way. Okay, so that's about all the background on you really need. Uh, today, the agenda is over here on the left side of the board for our class. Disregard all the equipment here. That is for the 140 class, which is going to uh, be on uh, mineral identification, hand specimens, mineral identification of uh, common minerals. There's lots of minerals, but there's not too many that are really all that common. So it's going to be identification of common minerals, and that will be a double session from 1.40 to, I think, 2.30 or whatever is something like that, whatever it says in the schedule. Okay? So that will be this afternoon. Uh, this morning is going to be energy from rocks. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on coal resources, put a few things on the screen, talk uh, about fluid resources, uh, which are energy resources from fluids, which of course are crude oil and natural gas. We'll mention a few words on synthetic fuels, radioactive fuels, and we have time, a little bit of information on geothermal energy, what that is, where it comes from, the different types of geothermal energy. There's basically three different kinds of geothermal energy. Okay. Uh, on the bottom down there is an announcement also. I'm teaching a six-week summer geology course here called Geology 109, and that will be offered here uh, from, I think it's the 25th of June or the 26th of June uh, through about the 8th of August. So it's basically a July course. So let me give you a few things for handouts. If you haven't already gotten them, this is information for this session here. out ahead of time, but I never know how many people are going to be here, so just pass them out briefly. Okay, and this, if you are interested or anybody is interested, or you know anybody's interested, is just a flyer on the summer geology course that will be offered here for six weeks. It's going to meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 1 in the afternoon till about 4.30 in the afternoon uh, for six weeks. Okay, so that's just a little bit about what it'll cover. I think you'll find a lot of general interest topics in there uh, on geology, stuff that everybody needs to know something about. Okay, first off then, let's talk a little bit about coal. I'm gonna kill some lights up front here, if that's okay. So we can see the board and the screen a little bit better. Get rid of that. Okay, coal, and this is a little table on coal. 
cut it down to where we can see the whole thing from side to side. Fire in the hole. That refers to a method of, of mining. It's called underground coal gasification, which I'm going to talk about in a short period of time. This is just some general information on coal. Coal, of course, originates from vegetation, from organic matter, from dead leaves, roots, and all kinds of organic matter that accumulates in swamps. And the swamps have fresh water. It does not decay. It's preserved, and it's buried. As it's buried, more and more heat is added, more and more pressure is added. Because we're burying it under layers and layers and layers of rocks over time. So the first thing we convert it to is peat. Okay? So it's converted to peat. And the uh, peat, which everybody knows, is soft, woody material that you put in the garden, etc. And then eventually, if you continue to bury that, continue to add pressure and heat, you convert it to lignite, which is the first rank of coal. Coal is ranked according to uh, how compacted it is and how it is changed by burying. So the first type is lignite, the second type is Subbituminous, so bituminous, and anthracite. So those are the four basic classes of coal, ranks of coal. We call those ranks, like in the military, rank and file, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So lignite is the softest type of coal, and anthracite is the most is the most altered coal. It's basically almost what we call in geology metamorphosed. It's changed into something that's very hard. So we call lignite brown coal. Um, then we have dull black, shiny black, and shiny black. Okay? Now, the percentage of carbon will vary because as you vary this in time, you take out the impurities and so forth in there, and it leaves more and more carbon. So lignite only has about 25 to 35% carbon, whereas when you get up to bituminous coal and you get to anthracite, you see it can go up to 88, 98% carbon. What does that mean? Well, BTU stands for British Thermal Units. British Thermal Units are the amount of heat that you can get from a given amount of coal, okay? A pound, whatever your amount is. And you can see the average there varies from 7,000 BTU per pound of coal for midnight all the way up to 12,000, 12,500 if you're talking about those, okay? Let me get you a couple of more sheets here. So those are ranks of coal, and that's the amount of carbon, the amount of BTU, and also it has a variable amount of sulfur in it. You can see it doesn't really depend exactly how much sulfur, because you can add as much sulfur and anthracite as you can in, uh, in late night. The percentage mined, well, most of our coal in the U.S. is either subbituminous or bituminous. A uh, very little bit of anthracite. We don't have much anthracite in this country. As you can see, it's limited to like 11 counties in northeastern Pennsylvania that actually mine anthracite. There's some in other places as well, but it's not commercial enough to be commercially significant. Okay? So most of our coal is subbituminous and bituminous. The locations here, and there's a map I'll show you in a moment, different places are lignite is mainly in the Texas Gulf Coast, North Dakota, and Montana. Uh, the bituminous is uh, in the east and uh, mid-continent regions, etc. Okay? The use is mostly for electricity, generation of electricity. As you probably know, moisture content, ash. We'll talk a little bit about ash as to what ash is, because ash is something that people uh, some people, anyway, have a fit about. These are coal basins, and the lignite is where it's mined. is shown as green here, U.S. coal basins. Uh, the bituminous uh, is the uh, orange here, et cetera. So those are the different colors from the different uh, kinds, ranks of coal. You'll notice that Michigan has a coal basin. Michigan was big in coal mining uh, in the, oh, I don't know, 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Of the, the, uh, maybe around uh, 1900, all the way up to about 1940. Michigan mined a lot of coal, and they had a lot of coal mines around. And they collapse every once in a while, and you read about the collapses here and there. But we do have a coal basin here. None of it is mined in Michigan now. It's not commercial grade. It's not sufficiently thick in seams and continuous uh, for mining purposes. But quite a bit was mined in the old days here from Michigan. Uh, 
skip over all that and let's move into coal ash here someplace. Um, so what is uh, what is coal ash? Well, when, the, when coal is deposited, remember it's organic matter. It is material that's uh, leaf material and, and, and stem material and root material. So it is all kinds of uh, organic material, plant material that's been converted first to peat and lignite and so forth. Okay. So in the process of it accumulating, it gets uh, it has also some impurities in it. Impurities by that I mean things that are not organic. Okay. Why? Well, silt blows in, dust blows in. We get wind storms and dust storms, and it blows in. And that's the material of silica and different kinds of minerals that are in there. So when you burn coal, there's always something that's not going to burn. You can't burn quartz. If we have quartz uh, silt in there, uh, it's not going to burn. So it's left over. And a little bit of the coal uh, will probably be non-combustible as well. And this material that's left over after you burn it is called coal ash. And coal ash, Somewhere around here, I do have a sheet on that. Well, I don't know where I put it on hand. Here it is. Coal ash. Okay? So, coal ash, of course, we know what it is. Well, is it toxic? Well, it's common in soils as well because we got the wind dust is going to blow and the wind's going to blow. It's going to blow material into soil as well as into swamps, et cetera, and coal beds. But it's in trace amounts. The state of Michigan, the Department of Environmental Quality, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, uh, when you're looking for uh, leaking underground storage tanks, they do require, depending on the uh, what, you, what the substance is, what the liquid substance that escaped into the environment is, into the soil, into the groundwater, depending on what it is, you may have to test for uh, trace metals. And they have 10 different trace metals that you have to test for in the state of Michigan. Okay. So it's also present in all uh, soils and background levels. Uh, cleanup is only required if it exceeds background levels, because background levels is if you went out and got soil from your backyard and tested it for metals, you would find a certain number of metals in there because it's naturally occurring in soil, these metals. Okay. So trace metals in coal ash, um, they're present naturally, and the USGS has tested coal ash for trace metals from a variety of different locations, from, from different uh, coal mining uh, operations or, or, or energy operations where coal is burned. The result is that they're, they're at background level for soil. And some of these are things that will be if they were concentrated enough toxic, but if they're not concentrated that much, they aren't. So now uh, they use, in the old days they used to just dump this stuff, coal ash, in a stockpile it, put it in landfills, but now it's a value economically because certain companies who make concrete will buy that from you and use it to make concrete, roof granules, blasting, grit, road material, wall board, various geotechnical and agricultural uses. So um, it's less expensive to use that than you want to mine those materials and then be able to use those. So that is something that's, I, I don't know what percentage of it is used. I don't think 100% of coal ash is uh, is used. Okay. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, I think, let me quickly refer to the outline. Let's see what I did not cover. Origin, coal rain, graphite. Graphite, if you take anthracite and you continue to metamorphose it, you continue to add heat, you continue to add pressure, you will convert to graphite. Graphite is pretty much pure carbon. It has the same chemical composition as diamond, by the way. There's something you know. So when you have a lead pencil with graphite in it, you've got a question. That's weird because we use graphite in pencils. Graphite is expensive. Right. It could be used. It's also used. Uh, it doesn't burn. So it's not. Because it can't have the same value as coal. You can't burn it because it's not really combustible. Uh, but it can be used if it's in powdered form as axle. Uh, lubricant, etc. It's almost like a greasy material, etc. Uh, it has the same chemical composition as diamond, but of course it's a very different structurally from diamond. Okay. Uh, let's see if I had anything else on there. Uh, I think I've talked about most of those things. 
So what is underground coal gasification? Okay. Well, we know that, hopefully everybody knows that there is something called a fire triangle. Okay. And you need three things to have a successful fire. You certainly have to have fuel. If you don't have something that burns, you're not going to have a fire. Usually if it's a house, for instance, it's going to be wood or material, whatever it's made of. And you have to have heat, obviously, to spark this and to combust it. What's the third thing we need? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yes. Without oxygen, we don't have fire. fire. So you have to have the three of those things. So firemen know this, and they put out the fire. You can remove any one of these three, and the fire goes out, obviously. Okay. So if you want to uh, remove this, for instance, you take water, you spray water all over it, you cool it down, you flood it. That cools it down below the ignition temperature, the fire can no longer burn. Pretty hard to take away the fuel because that's what is burning there. And if you want to use foam, then you can take and put it on top of the fire. And what will that do that smothers it? It can't get any oxygen. So the fire goes out. Electrical fires, they use foam, etc. So that is the fuel, that is the fire. Qualifier triangle. Well, that's a real fire, right? Fire triangle. Okay. So now we have, let's say we have, let's take that off the board and make some space here. And let's look at the coal bit. Okay. This is the surface of the ground. I'm going to make what's called a cross section. The cross section is if you were to cut away part of the earth, lift it up and look at it from the side. Cross section. You might be looking at a hill in the distance and you see the hill, but you're looking at it on the ground level. So you're looking at things from the side, from the cross section view, as opposed to a map view when you're looking straight down. So down here, someplace deep down here, we have a coal seam. Okay, so we have a sufficiently large coal seam, and we want to mine that. Let's say maybe this thing is 4,000 feet to 5,000 feet deep. That's too deep to dig it out. We don't want to dig it out anyway because it's dangerous. We've got to coal mine it. We've got to remove it. We've got to bring it to the surface. It might collapse on people, etc. Because of the methane content and so forth, it might light on fire. So we have a lot of problems with coal mining. We can only mine down to a couple thousand, two thousand, whatever feet. We can't go this deep. But now, what do we do here? Well, we want to mine this, and so we drill a hole here. Put a ring on the surface here, and drill down here until we get to the coal seam or just above the coal seam, and then we kick it out to the side. We call this a lateral. This, of course, is vertical here, but this is a lateral. Okay, so we can do that now. We can steer this drill bit off to the side and we can go out to the side and we can go here. So what do we have down here? Well, we have fuel. And the fuel is coal. So we have a lot of fuel down there. We want to take the coal out. We don't want the coal, we want the energy associated with the coal. So we don't really care about the coal. It's like mining, if you're going to mine something for gold or silver or whatever metal you're looking for, you can mine all of it and then you have to treat it and process it to take out what is of value, what is not of value, we call gange, and we pile that off to the side somewhere and get rid of it. Okay? But in this case, if we want to, we can just take the energy out of that coal seam, but we don't have to take the coal out of the ground to do it. So the first thing we do is we drill this hole in here. Well, we don't have any what's called porosity and permeability, which I'll talk about in a little while. So this is pretty solid. So we have to come in here. And we have to put pressure on it, and put water down in the hole, and frack it and break it out. So we have to break it up in here. So now that we've got it busted up in there, and so we, we've actually now creating what we call porosity and permeability. We've created that by, by breaking it up with hydraulic fracturing. Okay? Now, so now we've got fuel there, and we need something else. We need air, of course, which is oxygen. And we also uh, need a little bit of fire, okay? So we can do that easily enough. So we can pump oxygen down in here, and it goes out into these cracks and into these holes and into the broken up hole that we made. We can put oxygen in there. 
Now we've got two things. We've got fuel and we've got oxygen. So now we've got a way of doing it to where we can torch this down here. We can ignite it down at depth. Now we've got all three things going for us in there. So we're burning this coal down here. And this is called inside you uh, as opposed to excite you. Excite you is when you take something out of the ground that you want, you mine it, you take out what is valuable, and you throw the rest away as damaged material or useless material. Inside you, you take only out what you want. Okay? You don't take out everything else. So now we've got this fire going down in here, and what does that do? That creates methane. So we're converting that coal basically into methane uh, at that point. So now we've converted it over, and all we got to do is drill what we call an extraction well over here. This is an injection well. Okay, that well, that's an injection well. And this is an extraction well. Okay? And that extraction well then pumps out methane, gas. And that's what we want. That's, that's the product we want. We can take the coal out of the ground and we can take it someplace and we can gasify it and then use the methane to fire the, 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 the power plant if we want to do it that way. But we can also do that underground. It's called underground coal gasification as opposed to above ground coal gasification. When you mine the coal, take it out of the ground, gasify it, and use the gas for your uh, power bridges. So, man, push. No question? Okay. okay. All right, so that's called underground coal gasification. It's been around a while. It's been done. It's done in various countries in the world. I don't know how much it's been done in the U.S., but it can be done. And the beauty of it is that you don't have to remove anything from the ground, so there's not a safety issue. We don't really have an issue with, uh, with uh, people who are, let's just say, kind of radical environmentalists. You don't have a problem with them as well, and you don't even have to take it out of the ground. Now, you do have to plan if you remove a fair amount of it, you might have some subsidence here. You know, the plan for that. I mean, you're not going to do it under somebody's house or something. You go out and, and do that in a place, and you, you may have to plan for that. But you can engineer that. But this is a method of removing the coal from the ground without having to remove, removing the energy from the coal from the ground without having to remove the coal itself. So it's a good uh, method to use to look into research. As I say, it's not new. It's been around in Europe for some time. It's been around in other places for some time as well. Okay, I think that's all I really wanted to cover with coal because we have to get on here. My goodness sakes. We're eating up the clock in a hurry. Okay. All right. I want to talk a little bit about oil and gas first here. Uh, these are fluids in the subsurface. They're not the only fluids that we have in the subsurface, but they are fluids from the subsurface. Uh, so how do we get fluids in the subsurface? We have to have, we're talking about solid rock. If you have a bucket of sand, you pour water into it, obviously the water is going to go down between the sand grains and fill back up. So we understand that. But what about solid rock? Well, solid rock has holes in them. Some of them do. Some do not, and some do. And we call these holes pores. So if it has pores in it, it might be that you have a sandstone with grains of quartz like this. Okay, so they're all there. And they're cemented together enough to hold them because now we have a lithified rock, so we have to have some cementation. But there's also some holes left in there. And we call those holes pores, just like the pores that you have in your skin. So we refer to this as porosity. So if a rock has porosity, what does that mean? If it's 10% porosity, that means 10% of it is holes and 90% of it is solid rock. If it's 20%, then it's 20 and 80, okay? So we have to have porosity. Porosity in both whole fluids. Without porosity, you don't have any room for fluids to exist in the subsurface. Now, in addition to that, let's just say you have this sandstone and now you have fluids in here in the holes that are left in there between the sand grains and the cement, you have holes in there. But we have to have them interconnected. If there's a hole here, there's a hole there, there's a hole there, there's a hole there, and they're not interconnected, you can't move fluid in, nature can't move it in, man can't take it out, nature can't take it out. 
nobody can take them out. So this is called permeability. Permeability. Okay? And that is the transmissibility of fluid through a rock. So that means that you have effective porosity. That is, the poor throats. There are throats between here, and you can get, you can put fluid in, and you can take fluid out. So you have to have porosity and permeability. If you have porosity and permeability, then you can have subsurface fluids. What are subsurface fluids? Well, in the first place, we can have gas, natural gas. We can have oil. Okay, we can have fresh water. We can have fresh water, and we can have salt water, which yellow is called formation water. Formation water. When it's formation water, it's very salty, very briny. And when you compact it, let's say so we had a clay, and we compacted it and compacted it, squeezed it, squeezed it, and we squeezed all the water out, and it went into a nearby sand, and then they became lithified. And so we have the original seawater, because most of these sediments be they clay or, or sand, were deposited in the ocean. So we have seawater that's down there. So the deep fluids are formation water. What do I mean by deep? Well, the geologist talks about deep. He means greater than two or 300 feet. You got to remember, the center of the earth is 4,000 miles down there. The top of the mat, the top of the core, 2,000 miles down there. So to a geologist, two, 300 feet is very shallow. We consider that to be extremely shallow. Okay, so, all right, um, so those are the kinds of subsurface fluids. We can also have contaminants that are added by man. For instance, a leaking underground storage tank will have, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll can have spilled gasoline in the subsurface in the soil and the groundwater. Uh, we can have kerosene, we can have diesel fuel, we can have oil, we can have waste oil, we can have, uh, even in the old days for uh, dry cleaners, uh, used underground storage tanks with their perchloroethylene in. Spent chloroethylene to chloroethylene, uh, uh, chloroethylene to do the dry cleaning with. So that got into the groundwater zone. So there can also be the fifth one can be contaminants, but they're going to be shallow. Okay, they're going to be shallow in in uh, in the surface, as is the fresh water. Fresh water is really mostly what we call New York water, it's rainwater. So these things are very shallow, these guys can be deep. Or shallow in some cases, but mostly they're pretty deep, okay? So when we drill, let's put another cross section up here and let's talk about a well. So we drill a well, we have, this is the, I'm gonna represent, this is the open hole. Because down through here, we had a drill stem and we had a bit down here with teeth on the bit and the teeth were drilling away, etc. And we pumped mud, called drilling mud, down in there and it squirted out the jet's nozzles down here and that lubricates the rock so we can cut it. And it also brings the cuttings back up. We gotta get rid of these cuttings. I mean, we got material down there that has been cut. So we got to bring it up. So it serves to keep pressure on the formation in case we get an overpressured bed in here. We don't want to blow out, etc. So that's what we're drilling. Okay. And then after we get done drilling it, or get to a certain point in there, they'll pull out the pipe, they'll pull out the drill pipe, they'll pull out the bit from here, and they'll put casing in. Casing, if we look at it in cross section, nothing but steel pipe. Steel pipe is going to go down in there like that. We call that steel pipe casing. Then along comes a cement truck and puts a, puts a, a pipe down in there and pumps cement in there. Where does the cement go? The bottom of the hole is down here. So the cement is forced back up in here. The cement is forced up. So all this becomes cemented. Cementation in there. And then you go back in with a smaller drill bit and you continue to drill down lower down here. So now we have a little narrower hole down in here, and we do the same thing over again. We put the drill pipe down in there, the bit down in there, the mud brings up the drill cuttings, etc. And we get to a certain point down there, and we run another string of casing. This time the casing is smaller, and it fits down in here like so. So now we have casing again. Again we go in there and cement it, and all of this is cemented. All of this is cemented. So you see, this protects these shallow layers. 
Because remember, we have layers and layers all in here. These are sedimentary layers that we have all in through here and down to maybe about 200 or so feet. We're going to have fresh water. So we go down in there, we got two sets of steel pipe. We got two cement jobs. So it seals this off. Okay? Now, if this is a vertical hole we go in down, we also have the ability to kick it over like this on the side. Now we have a big shale bed here. Shale bed has a certain amount of natural gas in it, but it doesn't have any porosity and permeability to speak of. So we have to come in here and we have to hydrofrack it. What does that consist of? Well, it's mostly water. Primarily water, but it does have a few chemicals in it, we call them surfactants. And people worry that it's going to contaminate our freshwater aquifer, which is sitting up in here somewhere. Well, you've got two sets of steel pipe, you've got two sets of, uh, of, of cement layers in there, and now you come in here and you fracture this by putting water under pressure with a certain amount of chemicals in it, and you remove that, and now then you can produce the natural gas. And this we call hydrofracking. And some people get all bent out of shape about it. This has been done since 1948. Nothing new about hydrofracking. Because when we drill a well, oftentimes it'll have a show of oil and gas in it. If it doesn't, we just have to plug it in the bag. We call it a dry hole. Does it mean it's totally dry? No. It just means it does not have commercial amounts of oil in it or commercial amounts of gas in it. So we know that it's not commercial. So we call it a dry hole because for all purposes, from the oil geologist's point of view, it's a dry hole. It doesn't have anything of value in it. But it could have something there, and that something could be under pressure, and we could have a blowout, and we could have big gushers and all this kind of stuff that happens in the Middle East in certain areas. We don't generally have them. We have some blowouts occasionally, you know, the kind of blowouts in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, etc. There are blowouts that happen accidentally at times. Usually on land, that's pretty easy to control because you have blowout preventers that you can walk up to and close. If it's under 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet of water, yeah, it's tough to do that. You have to, you, know, you have to depend on uh, remotely closing it, etc. But anyway, that's what uh, fracking is, and there's nothing, there's no real big problem with it. It's just that some people do not understand that the fresh water is limited up here. All this down here is formation water. Formation water. And it's, it, we, we can't drink it. It's just too salty. It's brine. And we can't use it for drinking. We can't use it for agricultural. We can't really use it for anything. And that's mostly what you get when you get down here below a few hundred feet. Uh, so uh, we have to, if we drill a well and it has a show in it, we have to what we call complete it. We can complete it one of two ways. We can either hydrofrack it, if it's a sandstone, or if it's a limestone or dolomite, we can acidize it. Okay? And that's the method of completing. And that will increase the, the permeability of the process and will allow us to produce more fluid from that well or get a commercial amount of it. Okay. All right, um, a couple other things that I need to mention here. Uh, we don't really have time to get much into the origin of oil and gas because we're supposed to be out of here shortly. Uh, there's two basic hypotheses. One is called the organic hypothesis. One is called the inorganic hypothesis. Right now in the United States, the organic hypothesis holds sway. We feel that it's dead material from plants and animals, soft parts, etc., that have died over the millions of years. That's called the organic. The inorganic theory, on the other hand, or the inorganic looks at the fact that hey, there's lots of hydrocarbons out there in space. We've got the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn that have got lakes of hydrocarbons. We've got meteorites that have hydrocarbons. They're all over the universe, so why shouldn't they be part of the Earth? Because the Earth formed from the same materials as that is. Why shouldn't we have that down deep? And if so, that's converted rock to the surface. That's called the inorganic theory. Mainly the Russians, geoscientists and, and geologists agree with that. Americans agree with this. I don't know. When you look at the data, there's a little bit of evidence that probably most of the hydrocarbons may be organic in origin. We really just don't know. There can be some organic, and there's probably some of each in there. Okay? So that was uh, all I wanted to say about that. Uh, 
I needed to uh, mention just a little bit about synthetic fuel. What is synthetic fuel? Well, synthetic fuel, you have to remember, um, synthetic fuels. You have to remember, you have to go back in history. Go back to World War II. Hitler, okay? He had a big war machine going in World War II. He had to have fuel for his tanks and his airplanes and his trucks. He couldn't fuel it. He doesn't have any oil and gas in Germany to speak of. So what the hell did he use? Who in their right mind was going to sell Hitler crude oil during World War II? The guy was a madman. Nobody was going to sell him crude oil. Okay? So he took his coal. And the Germans figured out a way to make gasoline, diesel, aviation fuel from coal. It's called synthetic fuel because man makes it, but he makes it from natural products. It can also be made from natural gas. We have a lot of natural gas in this country. We don't know what to do with all our natural gas. We want to liquefy it and send it overseas. We can take that natural gas, convert it to gasoline, and put it in a tank and drive it away. We don't have to reconvert the engine to run on propane. So we can do these things. And all of that is called the synthetic fuels. And there's different ways of doing it. And I don't want to take very much time because I'm almost out of that stuff. But basically, basically there are these methods that the German people, uh, the German scientists have discovered. Uh, on uh, doing this, etc., and they can take coal, they can take natural gas, and by different methods, if we start with coal or natural gas, or we can use biomass, if we have that as well, you can gasify, you can go through this process, you can get seen gas, you can come out with diesel fuel, jet fuel, and gasoline. Okay? So that's synthetic fuel, and we're starting to do some of that. The U.S. Air Force is concerned about they don't want their supply disrupted in the event of some kind of big war or conflict or something, and so they uh, are in the process of converting coal into aviation fuel. So that's that. Radioactive fuels, I don't have much time to talk about that. It's basically uranium and thorium if it's for fission process, processes. What's the difference between fission and fusion? Well, if you take a, a big element, a, a high atomic number element, let's just say it's uranium or thorium or something like that, and you break it apart. You, you split the atom, you break it apart, what happens? You release energy. You release a lot of energy. And that's the source of the atomic bomb. We learned how to create fission, breaking apart of the uranium or thorium atom. So that's fission. And when it explodes, we call that the atomic bomb. Then somebody said, well, <clears throat> if we have a very light element, hydrogen, for instance, you even have these light elements. And if we combine them, we fuse them. We get a tremendous amount of energy released also. So that's the re that's the result of in the hydrogen bomb. The trouble is, it took so much heat <clears throat> to cause that fish fusion to occur for the hydrogen bomb that we had to have an atomic bomb inside of it as a triggering mechanism. So when we blew the atomic bomb inside the hydrogen bomb, there was enough heat there to, to split the atoms of the hydrogen and create the hydrogen bomb. And the hydrogen bomb then is bigger, stronger uh, than the atomic bomb. So that was basically the difference. And then if we coat it with all kinds of <coughs> cobalt and other stuff like that, it'll have a long half-life, then it becomes a dirty bomb, etc. Okay? Uh, the only other thing to mention here is geothermal energy. <clears throat> There's two kinds. There's hot spring energy which is uh, from areas where we have hot springs. And in that case, I don't have time to draw it on the board, but in that case, basically what happens is nature has provided the water from rainwater. Nature has provided the processing and permeability in the sandstones. And nature has provided the heat from below where there's a magma chamber or some type of hot rocks below them. So it's all there. All man has to do is drill a well into it, produce a steam well, run the steam <clears throat> through uh, uh, a turbine, and generate electricity. But that's easy to do. The trouble is you have to have an area where it works. Even if, fine if it's in Northern California, if it's in Iceland, if it's in the Italian Po River Valley, if it's in parts of North Island of New Zealand, where we have hot spring activity, we can do that. I walked around and, <clears throat> and uh, New Zealand, when I was over there one time, everybody had a steam well. The steam was coming out. They had the hot water supply right there coming out of their own steam well, and they could create heat for their building in the winter, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> now, now, there's another 
kind called deep dry hot rock heat mining. Deep dry hot rock heat mining is when man drills deep, 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 which is not cheap. You might have to go five miles, six miles, seven miles down. But the rocks down there are hot. Why? Not because they're close to the center of the earth, but because there's radioactive minerals down there. And all that radioactive decay makes heat. Okay? So we can, we can put a well very deep. But again, no porosity, no permeability. So we have to have a lateral going out and we have to frack that. We have to create our own height, our own porosity and permeability. No water down there either. So we got to get a source. We got to find a nearby stream, lake, wells, whatever we got. And we have to pump the water down in there. Now, the nature supplies the heat. Man made the porosity and permeability. Man put the water in there. And then we put an extraction well over here. So now we pump in the cold water, it gets heated down there, and we bring out the hot water and the steam, and we can run a power plant. It's called deep hot rock heat mining. Because we're actually mining the heat. We're not taking the rocks out of the ground. We're mining the heat and bringing that up. And that's a process that's been developed in the United States, and, and <clears throat> it's being used in Europe and other places as well. And uh, they, it, it will be something that goes, you have to watch out because when you frack areas, you don't want to go into a, a geologic fault where, where it's going to be sensitive to an earthquake and start uh, fracking down there because you could cause an earthquake. So you have to stay away from active faults, which is not really a huge problem. You can do that geologically. Well, I'm out of time. <laughs> so anybody has any questions, is welcome to stay. Uh, please fill out your form there. I know this was kind of quick and easy because we can only do so much in 40 minutes. And I wanted to cover as much as I possibly could. So I hope you have a little bit better understanding of energy from the underground. And it's now time to break at 11.40. So anybody who wants to stick around, ask questions or anything else, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks for coming. And anybody who does not have something special you really want to do, there will be a lab, a hands-on lab, at 1, I think, 40 in the afternoon. And that will be how to identify common uh, minerals in the very common. Okay, thank you for coming and hopefully I'll see some of you this afternoon.